Understanding the revelation that the church is a three-part entity after the pattern of Moses Tabernacle, Dr. William Hurst in the Institute of Strategic Christian Leadership helps you discover God's eternal plan for your life. Whether it be outer court ministry or holy place ministry or the much neglected Holy of Holies ministries, all believers must serve in at least one of the three. Listen now as Dr. Hurst helps you understand where God has designed you to serve. And now, Dr. Hurst. We're going to continue on the theme, God Changes the Heart. I think most of us recognize at this point in time that not, I'm not the only one that needs a heart change. In fact, some days I think I need a heart transplant. But I want to start with Joseph, a leader who had all bitterness worked out of him. He had gone down seven times before he ascended to the throne in Egypt. In Psalm 12 and verse 6 it says, The words of the Lord are pure words, try, as silver tried in the furnace of earth. I said tried in the furnace of earth. Tried in the furnace of earth seven times. <clears throat> yeah. Next, no. <laughs> Joseph received a word from the Lord in two dreams when he was about 17 years of age. And of course, we know what it said. You're going to rule over your brethren. You're going to rule over your father, mother, and brethren. And father even rebuked him after the second one. But it says Je uh, that Jacob pondered these things in his heart. Jacob knew what the word of the Lord was. And so he recognized something in what Joseph said, that this wasn't just Joseph in the realm of fantasy, but there was no possible way that he could see that that would be Joseph's position. In Psalm 105, verse 19, it says this, Until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. Now, the followers, uh, if we were doing a presentation, we would put Joseph on one side and Jesus on the other. And you would see on the screen two parallels. Jesus went down seven times before he came forth in the resurrection. Joseph went down seven times before he ascended to the throne. So there's quite a parallel there, isn't it? But listen, it says, until the time that his word came. Let me translate that this way. Until the word of timing came, the original word he received agitated him to growth. Joseph was willing to descend in order and, and didn't know when the ascension would come. Remember, this is a trial over a 13-year period. This is not just a short trial. And it started with Joseph going down to Shechem. Notice, in each of those things, if you looked at Genesis 37 and 39 and 42, you would find that he went down and it says this specifically. He went down to Shechem. He went down to Dotham. Then he went down to the pit. Let me give you an aside. You know what pit is an acronym for? Profit in training. All right. <laughs> <laughs> he went down to the pit. Do you know why the pit is a profit in training? There's only one direction he can look at. He can only... Look up. Because when he looks at the side of the pit, there's no light there. 
How many know we always look toward the <coughs> He went down to the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites took him down to Egypt. And it says he went down to Potiphar's house, and then he went down to the dungeon. And the furthest place away from the destiny was his place of deliverance. Yeah, wow. He sowed the seed of his own deliverance two years before he was delivered. Is it possible that we might be sowing the seed of our own destiny and deliverance into our destiny when we seem the furthest from it? Jesus in Philippians 3, it says he took the form of a servant was made in the likeness of man, after the fashion of a man. Then he humbled himself. He became obedient to death, even the death of the cross, and descended into hell. How do you think he got the key? And then he rose from the grave, forever conquering death and hell. And ascended far above. I love to remind the demons of this. Come on. Yeah. He descended, or he ascended far above every principality and power and every name that is named. That at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God's heart. It's a scripture the demons hate. Whether you type it, say it, sing it, they hate it. Mm -hmm. Because they know in their heart of hearts it's truth. Yes. And they cannot escape it. Amen. Mm -hmm. Noah. Noah found grace and ministry. God wants to raise up in this hour. A ministry like Noah, as it was in the days of Noah. And what do we focus on? The negative. Don't we? Mm -hmm. And we list down all the things that are going on today. We must be there. All those things. But wait a minute. As it was in the days of who? No. If that is going on, should there be a ministry like Noah rising up? Mm -hmm. Amen. Safety ark. The divine influence, grace is the divine influence of God upon the heart and its reflection in the life. Paul said that we could minister grace to the hearers. That means we can pour into them by impartation something that will help them come into the character and nature of Jesus. See, I don't always say it right, but I'm praying that I impart it right. Mm -hmm. I may get my tang all tumbled around my eye teeth so I can't see what I'm saying, but I'm hoping you get the right impartation. <laughs> he was a ministry of long suffering according to 1 Peter 3 and 20. What is long suffering? Suffering long with the faults of others. Lord. Would you increase my ability to be long-suffering? And the next day, mm -hmm. people with multitudes of fault come into your life. They're the answer to your prayer. That's right. <laughs> Lord, give me patience. And he sends tribulation. It's the answer to your prayer. Lord, I want more, more love. And he causes you to see all your fears. It's the answer to your prayer. Because perfect love casts out all fear. Oh, well, if I don't know I have fear, I can't reach in for love, can I? Mm. Hmm. Mm. Well, <coughs> you it could be dangerous to your health. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you might get it. Yeah, you might get it. He was also a man who was just and perfect in his generation in Genesis 6 and 9. Here is God's definition of perfection. And this should encourage us. One who walks in all the truth revealed to him is perfect 
in his generation. So if Martin Luther walked in all the truth revealed to him, he was perfect in his generation. If Charles Spurgeon walked in all the truth revealed to him in his generation, he was perfect, even though he smoked cigars. I don't know whether it was holy smoke or not. <laughs> See, we have judged, and we have our def definition of perfection, but we need to define it according to the Word. And so there are some people in past generations who have been overcomers in their generation and will stand with him in the throne, not because they knew all that we know, but because they walked in all that God revealed to them. And I think that we're going to see a lot of Chinese overcomers mm -hmm. who don't know much about this book, but have a relationship with God. Yes. That is absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. I've met one of them. If you get a chance, read the book, The Heavenly Man. Phenomenal book. Just made me weep. What the man, he's the one that had that tenth gift of the Spirit called getting out of jail. <laughs> Breaking out of jail. Because they would imprison him, and when it was time, God would say, Go now, and he was able to break out of jail. And he broke out of the country of China the same way. God said, go now. And he was a criminal according to all the Chinese laws. Yeah. But he went through all the customs, all the immigration, and God brought him mm. to North America. Yeah. Brought him first to Germany. And then I met him in Canada. Mm. And they won't let him in the States because yeah. he's a wanted criminal in China. Folks, we might get that status after a while. Yeah. Well, we better not go there. Come on. Come on. David was a man of perfect. Perfect what? Not perfect actions. Not necessarily even perfect thought, but perfect heart. But his heart was repentant when finally God got through to him. Now remember, one time God took nine months to get through to him. We will hardly give someone nine hours. See, we often try and do the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes longer, but he does it more, more deeply. And he gets to the root of the problem. Let the Holy Spirit do his work. Yes. When God began to deal with me about this, you know, I, I was brought up in a, in a church that, that, you know, long hair, uh, always pick on the ladies, by the way. You can always tell a legalistic church that pick on the women. Long hair, long skirts, long sleeves, high neck, long, ha uh, long tongue, and then in long uh, <laughs> You know, and, and I always pick on the women. You can always tell a church where it's off, because it'll pick on the women. Oh, well, we better not go there either. But God, when God began to take away my clothesline message, and then he said, I want you to stop preaching against sin to the Christians. Now, you can preach against sin to the Pharisees like I did, but you can't preach against sin to the Christians. Let my Holy Spirit do his work. And he said, I want you to quit Quit preaching judgment. All my sermon material was gone. <laughs> I couldn't preach. Clothesline. I couldn't preach against sin to the Christians. That's Holy Spirit's job. He'll convict the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment to come. That's the sermon material of 90% of your pastors. Oh, well, we better not go there, have we? God took nine months to deal with David before he sent the prophet to him. Now, the law said David should have been stoned. But because of his heart, when God got through, because of his repentant heart, 
God not, oh, oh, uh, well, we might as well kill another, barbecue another cow, right? <laughs> God left him in leadership. Didn't he? Mm -hmm. He left him on the throne. He left him ruling the nation even while he dealt with him. And if you get Reese's Chronological Bible and read that portion of David's life, what you're going to find is the dealings of God expressed in the Psalms written at the time. Mm -hmm. God took him through Job 33, verses 14 to the end. Experientially. But the Holy Spirit dealt with him. And as a last resort, God sent the prophet. We would send the prophet as the first resort. Because after all, you've got a clean church. Oh, well, we won't go there. All right. But God first dealt with him privately and... Again, give the Holy Spirit time to deal with your people. David was a man of mercy. In Isaiah 53 and 3 and Acts 13, 34, note this. It talks about the restoration of the sure mercies of David. David was a man who not only knew the mercy of God, but who expressed the mercy of God. And God made was so uh, thrilled with that attitude that he named a restoration after David. The sure mercies of David. The church today, leaders today, need a revelation of the mercy of God. Yes, yes. By the way, I'll tell you this. People will move and grow a lot faster if we get a revelation of the mercy of God. Amen. If they walk into your presence and they sense, sense mercy, what they're going to do is unlock <coughs> and yeah. get help quicker. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. They sense you're going to be conf confidential and you're not going to tell anybody even things that you could. They're going to come and share with you and get help faster. Mm -hmm. If they sense any judgment, yep. they're going to reserve. Amen. They're going to keep back. But Bill... What's the difference between compromise, long-suffering, and mercy? Good question. Mm -hmm. Compromise lowers the standing. Mm -hmm. Long-suffering and mercy. Mercy keeps the standard, but gives people time to grow up to it. Mm -hmm. God's looking for a ministry of mercy. Yes, he yeah. is. Yes, he yeah. is. David was a man of wisdom. According to 2 Samuel 14, verse 20, it says he had the wisdom as an angel of God. Lord, we need people who will have that wisdom. Now, many go through things, but don't gain wisdom. Yeah. See, there is a wisdom that's sovereign. It comes down from above. Mm -hmm. That's God. But also, it says a wise man will hear and increase learning and wisdom. There's a difference there. The Apostle Paul was joined in the Spirit to those God had given him. Years ago when God began to deal with me about that, I looked around who he joined me to and I said, uh, you really mean this, don't you? Have you ever looked at somebody and said, God, you're not really asking me to join myself to that chair. <laughs> God, you wouldn't do that, would you? God said, your reaction shows I must do it. <laughs> because being joined to them will do a work in you. No, no, God, it's them that needs to change. No, no, with that attitude, Bill, you need to change. Paul rejoiced with them that rejoiced and was able to weep with them that wept. Not because somebody communicated with him, but because he was joined to them. There you go. See, there's an invisible in the realm of the Spirit that the body of Christ really needs to get hold of. Because yes. we're coming to days when we may not be able to gather like this. Right. Or yeah. we, we're so far spread apart, we'll be gathering with different bodies, but God will have joined us and we'll know when one another's in trouble, mm -hmm. even though there's no phone communication. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. Amen. Because we're joined one to another by the Spirit right. of the living God. Yeah. And see, in His blood, flows yeah. to being able to be touched 
with the feelings of the infirmities God has joined, uh, those whom God has joined us to. Second, or First Thessalonians 2 and 7, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. Lord, teach us how to be gentle with your people. We know how to be gentle with our children, most of the time. But do we know how to be gentle with others? With those who are fragile in the church? Paul said, I was gentle among you. How gentle? As a nurse cherishes her children. Leaders need to learn how to cherish their people. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. In first or Second Timothy two twenty four, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle only to the Christians, and do it that like with the others. Mm -mm. No. Oh, no. <laughs> be gentle unto who? Oh, no. oh. oh I hate that word. <laughs> Come on. There's some people I don't want to be gentle. Yeah. Gentle unto all men. The one I'm harshest with is the one that measures my level of gentleness. But what does it mean not strive? The original word strive means arguing. No arguing. No debate, no defending myself or my position. See, if I defend myself, he won't defend me. Mm -hmm. If I let you defend me, he won't defend me. So, if anybody says anything against me, don't defend me. Because I want him to be my defense. Mm -hmm. By the way, he's done well for me over 45 years of ministry. Mm -hmm. I've been to the bottom at least, completely, at least twice. But he brought me back up. I've walked away from situations with nothing. Mm -hmm. He's brought me back up. Mm -hmm. He is my defense. Mm -hmm. Be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. Oh, I mean, love that word patience. Mm -hmm. Patient, able to give grace in all or in to all in any situation. In Titus chapter 3, verse 20, speak evil of who? No man. But what about no man? No man. And not be brawlers, but be gentle and showing all meekness unto all men. Meekness is this: a quiet, secure strength. Based in a mature relationship with God. Moses was the meekest man in all the earth. God has got to produce some meek leaders. Who are secure, not because of their position, but because of who called them. And they know who called them. Now, here's what I say. Lord, I know who's called me. And if I, if I didn't have any more ministry, I would still be an apostle to God. Mm -hmm. But Lord, please don't test me on that. All right. <laughs> How many understand that? Yes. My wife said to me one time, she said, find a place to minister. You're miserable to live with. <clears throat> that was quite a number of years ago. But see, Chuck Swindoll says, if you can be happy doing anything but ministry, go do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. So if you can be happy doing anything else, you're not called to ministry. Mm -hmm. But guess what? I'm miserable doing anything else. Mm -hmm. And so is everybody around me. No. <laughs> God's got to do work, see. All right. In 1 Thessalonians 2 and 11, And you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. Underline in this the word comfort, the ability to console. That comes out of ministry. 
In 1 Kings 10 and 24, And all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. Wisdom is a heart issue, not a head issue. Many people, they're ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge. They go for degree after degree after degree, and all they got is more degrees than a thermometer. Exactly. Exactly. That's true. God wants to put wisdom in your heart. And the heart is the combination of the emotions and the mind. Now briefly, look at this. In Proverbs 9 and 1, it says, Wisdom has built her house. Whose? Her house. Oh, wisdom is female. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let me say that again. I don't think it quite registered. <laughs> Wisdom is female. Mm -hmm. James 3 and 17. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. They are found in James 3 17. Listen to this. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. List them again because there's what do pillars do? Support the support. Here's I was in uh, Brantford, Ontario, ministering on an Indian reservation, the Indian reservation there, and I had three services that day: one at eleven, one at three, and one at seven in three different locations, an hour to each location. At the end of the service, the Lord said to me, I want you to go, the morning service, I want you to go back and minister to that lady, prophesy over that lady in the back row. And I'm on my way back and I have nothing. I mean, how many know that that's scary? Yes, it is. I have nothing. All I know is that He wants to minister to her. I get my hand on her head and the Lord said, you are called to be a pillar of wisdom in the house. And of course, we used to think that was one thing, but he began to go through this list and name what one he wanted her to manifest. So God can have seven different pillars of wisdom in the house to hold up the covering. I mean, the roof. I'll just leave that. <clears throat> Purity, peaceable, gentle, Easy to be entreated or approachable. Ministry must be approachable. Yes. <clears throat> Full of mercy and good fruits. All nine of them, actually. With partiality or no, with, without partiality, no favorites. Without hypocrisy, <laughs> what you see is what you get. Now, this does not give excuse. For hurtful behavior, if viewed in the light of the whole context. Some, type, some people say, in fact, I have one sister that I finally cut off. Because every time she spoke to anybody, she was hurtful to them. And I'd stayed with her longer than anybody else. God said, you don't have to do this anymore. Now, anybody that knows me, knows I have long suffering but I heard from the Lord and he said you don't just write her and tell her you don't have to take this anymore I had a struggle doing that because I've always been on the other side but there comes a point she was using I have to be truthful to remain in a condition of non gentleness to remain hurting people every time she spoke. And said, well, I don't want to be a hypocrite. No. And see, this hip hypocrisy is a thing of the heart. It's not something external. Because mm -hmm. he's the one that set the example of being gentle. Mm -hmm. To how many? Oh, oh. man. A teachable spirit, Proverbs 1 and 5. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain unto wise counsels. The ability to listen should be in a leader. Mm -hmm. 
A safe leader is one who will listen. He is also one who will learn. Solomon said, Lord, give me an understanding. Not a hand. 1 Kings 3 and 9, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart. And out of that understanding heart comes the ability to judge and discern. Underline that word, discern, between good and evil, or good and bad. I always thought it was easy to tell the difference. No, because you see, good and bad is in the motivation, not in the action. Mm. Hello. Mm -hmm. God said to him, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart. I want to come to this one. And even though I can't remember whether this is the end or not, I want to end on this one. A man with an excellent spirit. Or a spirit of excellence. You don't have to do everything absolutely right to do it excellently. Because excellence is a condition of spirit. It comes out of your spirit, not out of your doing. That's why I'm praying, God, I know I don't play the accordion like a dear brother I know. But I do it with an excellence of spirit. And, you know, one, one dear pastor who is ordained under us, he said, he, the first time I met him, I walked in with my accordion because they told me they had no music and accordion better than no music. So I walked in with the accordion and he said, oh no. <laughs> I have never heard an anointed accordion to, before and we're going to have to endure accordion tonight. Of course, God showed up, thank God. <laughs> and, and there was an anointing. He said, you're the first man I've ever seen that can play the accordion with anointing. Well, I, didn't, I don't play excellently. I chord, I find my way around, I do some stuff I don't even understand. But I play it with an excellent spirit, a spirit of worship. And out of that worship comes anointing. Out of that anointing, you know, the anointing covers my mistakes. Amen. Now, I don't make the mistakes on purpose. <coughs> but it covers them. Because the anointing is the important thing. All right. Daniel was a ministry for the end time. The whole book of Daniel is prophetic of the end times. Not just the text in it. And remember, Daniel was under the Old Covenant. Now, I want us to read something here in Daniel 1 and 3. And the king said unto Aspenaz, the master of the eunuch, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, of the king's seed or royalty, and of the princes. Children in whom, and then he names some qualities. Remember, this was under the Old Covenant. This was under the law that these things were worked into their lives. And I've heard and read that our covenant is better. So, if that can be produced in relationship with God under the law, it can definitely be produced in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ under the age of grace or the church age. Children in whom there is no blemish, but well favored, and skilled in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in king's palaces, and whom they might teach the learning and language of the Chaldeans. For as much as an excellent spirit, Daniel 5.12, for as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams, showing of hard sentences, and I, this is the one I want, an anointing to dissolve doubts. Mm. Under the old covenant he had this. Mm -hmm. I mean, no, i got a ways to go yet. Mm -hmm. It's okay, you can put up your hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
They were found in Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Here's the listing. No blemish. Well-favored to be handsome or comely. Skillful in all wisdom. Cunning in knowledge. Cunning in understanding science. I used this one time for a youth conference. Can you see how this would help? Daniel was 20 years old at the oldest when they said this of him. Mm. When Babylon, oh, come on now. Mm. when Babylon picked him, wow. the world knows what they want, and they know what's right, and they know what leadership should be. Not only was he cunning in understanding science, ability to, or dignity, ability to stand in king's palace, and the last one, and probably the most important, teachable. A leader who is not teachable will not be able to lead beyond where you meet them. Mm -hmm. They were found in Daniel. Excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting of dreams, showing of hard or difficult cryptic sentences, and dissolving of doubts. Now here's the challenge. In Matthew 9, 38, Jesus said, Pray ye therefore, what? Lord. The Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers. Luke 10, 2, the same thing is quoted. Now briefly, there are four types of harvest in the scripture. Because see, God does, doesn't just want leaders. He wants us, train us to bring in the harvest. harvest. The four types of harvest in scripture. Grain or wheat harvest. <coughs> illustrated by both the parable of the sower and the parable of the wheat and tares. And that's the word of the kingdom and the children of the kingdom. That's the harvest. See, what I'm, I believe God is getting ready to do is to bring in the harvest of the children of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. What's that mean? Those who've had the word of the kingdom planted in them and it has grown to maturity. Mm -hmm. The second harvest, the vineyard. Now that's not the denomination. Mm -hmm. The vineyard is the body of Christ, ripe grapes. The gathering of the clusters for wine. New wine is found where? In the cluster. We did a communion service uh, in, at the uh, conference we did in Syracuse. And I went out and bought some grapes. And I had some raisins. <laughs> <laughs> and first I said, I want each of you to take some raisins and chew them. And then I sang the song from about 1972, the two, two lines I remember. A grape on its own becomes a dry raisin. <laughs> We've got many raisin, cans of raisins, supposedly in the body of Christ. <laughs> but Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you abide in me, you bear much fruit. The gathering of clusters for wine is a type of the harvest of the body of Christ, Christians bringing forth ripe fruit. In Song of Solomon 7 and 12, it says, she, uh, he says to her, Come, let us go up into the vineyard. There's a harvesting or a bringing together of the body of Christ. Am I called to that harvest? The third harvest is sheep bearing lambs. That's one on one witnessing, bringing forth how? After your kind. As an apostolic ministry, or as a ministry, when I lead someone to the Lord, guess what I expect them to become? Mm. Ministry. Why? Because you bring forth after your kind. We've left the bringing forth of sheep to shepherds and wondered why. We got such a bad rap. 
Why did we get such a bad rap? Because we expect the shepherd should bring forth after his kind. Sheep bring forth after their kind. God's heart is that the people win people to Christ. The congregation win others to Christ. The pastor feeds, and when God brings someone to him, he will bring forth shepherds. Let everything bring forth after his kind. Why have our church has not grown? Because all shepherds do is bring forth more ministry. And then we wonder why it's top heavy. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, we won't go there, will we? <laughs> then there's the netting of fish. Scripture's very clear that the sea is the world. That then clearly refers to bringing sinners in in multitudes. Mm -hmm. That also is a harvest. So here it is. What harvest is it that you're called to? Pray ye therefore. What? That the Lord of the harvest. The Lord of the harvest, that he will bring forth laborers where? Into his harvest. Not yours. It's not my kingdom. It's not my wheat. It's not my vine. It's not my sheep. They aren't my fish. It's his harvest. I believe God is calling forth these type of laborers. When you see a need, now let me speak for a moment especially to the intercessors. Does this give you new definition to pray? Mm -hmm. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. When you see a need in the church, for the body of Christ to come together, or for the, wine, the, the grapes to come into the cluster, what should you be praying? Lord, send in vine gatherers. When you see God working the kingdom in some, and there needs to be some wheat harvesters, Lord, send in wheat harvesters. When you see the need for sheep to bring forth lambs, Lord, send those and bring forth those from our midst who are able to bring forth lambs into the fold. And Lord, send us some of what we used to call evangelists to cast the net into the sea of humanity. By the way, there's only once where you can find that Jesus ever caught one fish. All the rest was net fishing. And he only did the line fishing when he had to pay taxes. <laughs> right? Yeah. It, everything else was net fishing. And we're trying to do line fishing. Mm -hmm. True. Lord, true. you're going to see, to use the old methods of fishing is not going to work. Lord, teach us how to net fish. Amen. So when you see and you want many sinners brought in, and, and beloved, we need that just as much as we need the other three harvests. But Lord, send good fishermen, not fishy men. <laughs> Good fisherman. <laughs> Lord, send forth laborers into your harvest. We started out talking about what a safe ministry is. But see, we can, this harvest can be brought in if we have a safe place. Amen. Safe leadership, senior leadership, safe, and for lack of a better word, I want to I'll call them staff, but they could be the other four ministry gifts. They could be deacons, they could be elders. 
but Lord, produce a safe leadership mm -hmm. so there's a safe place to bring in for sheep to bear lambs. They usually do that in the fold, not in the field. And for fishermen to bring the net in full of fish. Lord of the harvest, mm -hmm. we come to you tonight. And we ask that by your grace, we've laid out a, a phenomenal requirement even for ourselves. But Lord, this is not our standard. This is yours. Many of these things were produced in the men and women in the old covenant. And therefore, our covenant is better. Jesus, we give you permission to work this in us. Yeah. Because we want to see safe leadership produced that can have people in their heart. We want to see safe staff produced that can have people in their heart. And we want to have a safe place for you to bring in the harvest. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. So take me into